one of the things that I'm continually reminded of, uh, 30 years ago, I was a youth pastor in the Chicago area for about four years. And what I'm continually reminded of when I hear students give a report like what we heard today is, this is not the church of tomorrow. This is an integral part of the church today, right now. It's not just tomorrow. And uh, just really thankful for what the Lord did through this group. Well, stories of uh, turnaround and transformation capture our attention. In 1986, the uh, Minnesota Twins baseball team was uh, suffering through a really dismal season. Things got so bad that people around the Twin Cities who had tickets to Twins games couldn't give them away. Uh, nobody wanted to go to see the Twins. It was such a, uh, such a disappointing season. I heard one story about a man who uh, had some business in downtown B Minneapolis, and so he drove downtown, and he had tried to give away two tickets to a Twins game, and there were no takers. So when he went downtown Minneapolis, he, uh, he left his window down on the driver's side, he put two tickets on the dash, downtown Minneapolis, and he went and did his business. When he got back to the car, there were four tickets on the dash. It was a dismal season, but the next year, 1987, the Minnesota Twins won the World Series. It was an amazing story of turnaround. And there's something captivating about stories of turnaround and transformation. We're, uh, we're in a series, or we're going to begin today, a two-week series called Stories of Impact, the Parables of Jesus. And this week and next week, we're going to be specifically looking at the parable of the prodigal son. This week is part one, and next week is going to be part two. In this powerful story, Jesus was not only, um, not only presenting a magnificent story of turnaround, but he was actually teaching those with ears to hear something about what God is like. During the life and ministry of Jesus, he, uh, he clashed with a first century group of leaders who were called Pharisees. What stoked the controversy were the opposing views of what God is like. The Pharisees viewed God primarily as a scorekeeper. They taught that uh, God only accepts people who are good enough. Not surprisingly, they were the ones who decided how it is that we measure if people are good enough. Jesus... Uh, was at odds with them because he presented a very different view of God. He taught that God the Father loves to reconcile people who are in some way relationally disconnected from him. Jesus taught that uh, God indeed is holy. There's none like him. He is set apart. He also taught that uh, God loathes sin and rebellion and he loves us. Because he loves us, he took the initiative to address our sin dilemma. God loves us because he loves us, not because we've measured up. And curiously, this vision of God that Jesus presented ignited controversy with the Pharisees. And the clash really related to this question, what is God like? What is God like? And it was into that clash that Jesus told a trilogy of three stories. We find these three stories in Luke 15. If you have a Bible with you, you could turn to Luke 15 right now. If you have a Bible app on your phone, you could go to Luke 15. As we've said in the last couple of weeks, just turn that ringer down. This passage is also going to be on the screen. But we want to note this. When Jesus told stories, 
He didn't tell them in a vacuum. There was an audience around him when he told his stories. Luke 15 opens this way. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So in this trilogy of stories that Jesus tells, uh, there's this audience that's around him. Tax collectors and, and sinners, those who in many ways were considered outcast in that first century and in that locale. And then there were Pharisees and teachers of the law, religious leaders who scorned the outcast. And there was tension. The trilogy of stories that Jesus included in Luke 15 involved the parable of the lost sheep, which is found in verses 3 to 7, the parable of the lost coin, which is found in verses 8 to 10, and then the parable of the prodigal son, verses 11 to 32. In all three stories, there's joy when something that's lost is found. The third story in the trilogy is a story we've come to know popularly as the parable of the prodigal son. Now, for the record, it's curious that that parable is referred to as the parable of the lost son singular. In fact, Jesus opened the story by saying there was a man who had two sons. When we come to the parable of the prodigal son, we're really talking about a story about two sons. In fact, uh, I don't think it's unreasonable to say, and we'll see this more next week, that this parable could be called the parable of the prodigal sons, plural. This week we look at the younger son, Next week, we look at the older son. As the story opens, and I want, you to, I want you to just see this. As the story opens, both sons are lost. Though their lostness was expressed in very different ways. Here's how the two sons were similar. Both were more interested in the father's things than they were in the father's heart. Both were more interested in the father's things than in the father himself. Again, if you have a Bible with you, we're going to look at this story. We're going to look at Act 1 of the story in verses 11 to 24. Next week, we'll look at Act 2, verses 25 to 32, which really focuses then on the older son. But beginning at verse 11, this is what we read. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he, the father, divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses... He said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. 
the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. That's the end of Act 1 of this two-act story that Jesus told. As I said, next week we'll look at Act 2. In this story, there are three primary characters. There's a younger son, an older son, who we'll look at more next week, and a father. The first character that we meet in the story is uh, the younger son. The younger son makes a request early on in this story that was brutal and honestly incredibly disrespectful. For him to ask for his share of the inheritance while his father was still living was like telling his dad, I wish you were dead. The younger son's share would have been about one-third of the estate. In that ancient culture, uh, the older son would receive twice as much as the younger son. We learn in verse 12 that the father in the story agreed to grant the younger son's request. It seems that the younger son must have sold off his share of the estate and converted it to cash. It was cash that the younger son was after. Evidently, he was a big spender. He was a brash guy who was out to make a name for himself, and oh, he was known. You can draw a crowd when you throw around some serious bling-bling. Funny thing about that crowd, though, the crowd sort of dissipates um, when he starts running low on funds. The same crowd that celebrated him while he was buying the next round and leaving big tips, well, that crowd starts to dwindle. And the younger son's funds dwindled. It's kind of a bitter irony, isn't it? That the promise of the high life can leave you feeling like a low life in its wake. And this young son drank deeply of that bitter irony. He ran out of funds and he ran out of friends. A famine struck the land where he was living and he was destitute. He had squandered everything that he'd been given. The resources, the opportunity, even the honor of the family, family name. He'd squandered everything. And we're told in verses 15 to 16 that he got hungry enough to look for work. Apparently in his desperation, this younger son did what would have been unthinkable for a Hebrew at that time. We're told this 